Okay, so first off, I'll just uh, notify everyone that in the front of the room, we have the submissions folder off on the side there. And if you open the submission folder, see, just a bit slow today. Up here on the first one, we have the first mandatory meeting for the project. And if you enter it, You can download the team project uh, um, assignment there, and you can also see the deadline for it. So it's the 16th, uh, I believe that's uh, next Friday. So you have to have uh, done your meeting with me and Torbjörn by next Friday. You also have to upload into this folder uh, a scanned copy of the brainstorming sheet that you are bringing to the, uh, to the meeting. Also, in the submissions folder, we have the submission one, which is due in two weeks after your CAD study time. So that's 12 o'clock in two weeks. You can see it. We just open it. So you can see this one is the, the 23rd. So it's two weeks from now. And then you have both the lecture and you also have your CAD study for that, for that day also. That's the Friday. Uh, and there you have all the information you need inside the PDF. You also have the information on how you are going to submit it to here. Because you are going to, to compress it into one file and then you are going to upload it to this folder on Fonta. That's how you submit it. So there's a, a lot of information on how it's supposed to look like when you submit it. And there is also also the information on what you're supposed to do. And so long as we get through, uh, uh, through uh, practice task one and two before you are to submit, you have learned everything you need to know for the submission. So it's not a very complicated submission. And this first one isn't really, really all that important to get perfect either. Because this first one is my basis for giving all of you comments on your work. So basically giving you the room to improve for the next submission. So it's really submission two and submission three that are the most critical for your grade. While submission one is you doing as good a piece of work as you can with it, and then me giving you comments on what you need to improve. <coughs> so we also have a small technical problem. Uh, with Invento because they've installed Invento 2017 on all of your computers, but they forgot this one. So I have Invento 2015, which is not a problem so long as we're doing uh, 3D parts, modeling those. That's uh, all, uh, everything looks more or less the same. But as soon as we start trying to do two dimensional drawings, the uh, startup looks quite different. So today we are going to, to focus on 3D modeling. So we're going to try to uh, model both practice task one and two uh, today. And then next week we will create the drawings because uh, during the weekend they are going to install it on this, this computer also so that we don't have any, any difficulties with things looking completely different up here than what it does on your screens. Yeah, we'll start off with uh, creating a new project. This is uh, a nice way to, to start off uh, every practice task, just to create a project for it, because then you get everything gathered into one place. So we have up in the launch part up here, you see there's a button named projects. We click that one and we get this window. As you can see, I've already created a project called Practice Task 1, but I'm going to create another one also, so I'm going to call it 1B for your group. So this is for, for the A group yesterday. So I'm going to create a new project down here. So press the new button. And then we have two choices there. We have a single user project, and we have a vault project. And Vault, that is the, uh, that is the, uh, the database uh, software that uh, Autodesk creates. So it's a, it integrates 
into Invento. So it's a, it's a very useful thing to have in a company because if one of you decide to work on one part or one drawing, uh, do work on it, then you will have to check it out so that no one else can do work on this one. So you won't end up with having people doing work on the same file uh, at the same time. But since we are not employed in a company for now, we are going to use a single user project for this one. We click the next button, then we get this part up. We have a project name that we need to fill in, and we also need to choose a folder <coughs> for it. So, for project name, I would, uh, in my case, I'm going to call it the practice task one, and then I'm just putting a B behind it just to differentiate it between uh, the one I created yesterday and the one I'm doing for you. You can just call yours practice task one if you want to, or anything else if you want to give it another name. And then we're going to change the folder because right now it's trying to to uh, store it to the uh, local hard drive. And we don't want that because that means that you will have to sit at that exact computer every time you are working on it. We want to uh, store it on the, the H disk. So you go to my computer, which is this one, and then you choose the one with the H behind. It will be your student number and then an H. Choose that one. So, it's here. so I've created a a lecture folder just to just to have my have all of my lectures uh, gathered in one place. And there you can see I have a different folder which is called Practice Task One. But I'm going to create a new folder. It's called practice task 1B, just so that I get to do this all over again. So then I do this one, create new folder. And then I can fill in the name there. So I'm going to call it again the same as the project, practice task 1B. Now the important thing now is not to press OK. Because if you, if you see, it, uh, see here now, we have practice test 1, practice test 1B in my case here, in the lecture folder. But down here, it says new folder. So it hasn't yet, even though this one is marked with, with blue, it isn't the one that's actually chosen right now. So what we just need to do is to click on one of the other folders first and then click back to the one we're going to use. So I'm just going to click on the lecture folder again and then I'm going back to practice task 1B and now it says practice task 1B here. So that's just a, a small glitch I think when you're creating new folders. It doesn't really manage to auto select the new folder that you've created. So then you press the OK button and then we do finish afterwards. So now we can see here I have practice task 1B and I also have a blue check mark beside it, which means that this is the active project at the moment. So it's going to, it's going to store everything on my H folder, in the uh, on my H drive, in the lecture folder, and then practice task 1B. So no matter where I am on this school, I will have access to my H drive which is my, my personal server. And then I can start working no matter which computer I'm uh, sitting at. So, so it's a lot better way of doing it. Then we click done. We have the correct project marked. And now we're going to start a new part. So I have new up there. And when I click it, we get this window up. And you have a lot of things to, to choose from here. We don't want to go directly into the templates folder, eh? because if I choose any of these, uh, these options, 
Uh, I'm most likely going to get them in inches and imperial units. We don't want that. The same happens if I go into the English folder, then I will also get imperial units. So if I instead choose the metric folder, and there there's even more to choose from. So what we're going to start off with is creating a standard part. And that is these up here, those are the parts. We are creating a standard part. We're going to use millimeters for it. And that means that the file ending is .ipt, which stands for inventor part. So we just mark that one. And then we press create. Then we're in the main window of uh, the Inventor uh, 3D modeling part. So you can see we have a, a, an X and Y axis here, and we also have a Z axis that is moving out this way to give us three dimensions. We have a view cube up in the corner there. Right now it says front, which means that we are looking straight at the cube, but we can also rotate it. So if I push the corner here, now I've flipped it a bit, so now you can see both the x, y, and z axis here. So I've flipped the entire, entire uh, uh, coordinate system. And now you see we have front, we have right, and we have top of this cube. So this is uh, a cube that we use to orient ourselves, basically just to see where, where are we looking at this uh, object from. Are we looking at it from behind, or from the front, or from below, or from the top, whatever. So this one will tell us where we are doing this. <coughs> so to start off, we need to create a two-dimensional sketch. And then we have this button over here. And as you can see, if you just let your mouse pointer hover over buttons here, it's going to open up these uh, quite large tooltips. And they show you basically, tell you and show you exactly what this uh, function is going to do. So if you're ever kind of uh, a bit unsure which button it was you were supposed to press now, just let your mouse pointer hover across it and it's going to give you these tooltips which might help you decide exactly which button it was you needed. So we press this one for the 2D sketch and now it's created these uh, orange uh, planes that are going. So we have one plane going here that is the Z and Y axis, and it's going straight across here. And we have one plane going straight across here, which is the X and Y axis. And we have one plane that is going more or less horizontally here. So it's the Z and X axis that it follows. And all the way in the center, we have the origo of the, of the uh, coordinate system. And although we are going to mostly try to center our sketches on the center point of the coordinate system. It's not a huge problem if you don't do that. If you uh, miss the center and place it somewhere else, that's not a huge problem. Uh, but it can be nice to, to, uh, to, uh, to try to get it in the center just to be able to use these axes if you're going to rotate stuff. So it's a bit easier to use the, the, uh, the x, y, and z axis instead of starting to fool around with the other axes. So. Now we're going to choose one here. We are going to create this, this plate, basically. Uh, for my part, I prefer choosing the horizontal plane when I'm going to create a sketch, because then I'm basically making it as if it's lying flat on a, a table surface. So I move my mouse pointer across here, and you see when I move it to the horizontal plane, it lights up, so it becomes more white. And the same will happen if I move it to one of the other planes. But we want, or at least I want, this X set uh, plane. You can choose whichever you want to, that's not a problem. That's one of the things you're going to learn in, the, in this uh, program. Usually there are, there are uh, at least three more ways to, of doing stuff than what I'm showing you. So that if, if you feel that you want, it is uh, more natural for you to do it in a different way than what I'm doing it, that's completely okay. 
nothing is correct or wrong uh, in the ways of doing stuff. So now we're going to choose this one. And now it has flipped my top pair, so it's put it sideways. So just, just to make it a bit easier for myself, I'm going to flip it back. You've seen that arrow up there? So now it says top the right way around. So now I'm looking at it from, from the top here. <clears throat> the first thing we're going to do is to create a line. But before we start creating the line, we're going to choose an option that is named construction line. So we're going over to the formats over here. And the construction line means that it, it, instead of creating a regular line, it creates a dotted line. And we are only using that line as a reference for our other lines. It's not going to be a part of our actual design. So I'm going to mark that one. You see the button up there has turned blue now. And then I move over to the line function. So I choose this one. And now it wants me to place a starting point for the line, and then I'm going to place an end point for the line. And what I'm going to do is uh, just place it slightly at an angle right across most of my screen here. So I'm going to start off here. Yeah. Back to the line function. So we have the, uh, the uh, construction line up there, which we have marked so that it is blue. And then we have the line function over there. So when we choose this one, it wants us to place the starting point first, and then we're going to place the end point. So I'm going to place the starting point over here. And I'm just going to drag my mouse pointer across the screen here. And what you can see now is that if I move it, move my mouse pointer so that the line becomes horizontal, I get this this symbol here. And this symbol means that it is locked into a horizontal position. You can also see by having 180 degrees across here. But I want to do this manually now because I want to show you how to do it. Uh, but Inventor does this with a lot of its functions. It sort of uh, auto-completes stuff for you while you are doing it. But right now I'm going to force it to not auto-complete it, just so that I can show you how you can do it manually, because the auto stuff doesn't always work, or maybe it works uh, slightly differently than what you intended, so it's nice to be just aware that it is there. So I'm going to put it slightly at an angle, so that it's not locking into anything. And now you see it didn't become a, 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 a continuous line, it became a dotted line instead which was because we're going to use it as a reference line. And also, Inventor wants me to continue making lines, because that is usually what you do. You start off at one point and you create several lines in a chain. But we're only going to create this one line first, so you can either push the escape button on your keyboard, or you can push the right mouse button and select OK. And now you also see that the, the line button up there isn't blue anymore. So now it's not, it doesn't want us to create more lines. Now we're going to look at the constraint part of uh, the toolbar up here. So all of these buttons that are in the constraint area, they, we can use those to, to force our lines into uh, certain uh, ways. So, sorry. It is uh, important that you really raise your hands when you need help because uh, there are so many screens here, so the student's assistant can't see you if you're just sitting like this. <coughs> so, the different constraints that we have here is we can force it to be a specific dimension, if we want that. We can force two points to be on top of each other, so connected. We can force two lines to be uh, on the same line. We can force circles to have the same center point. We can force them to be uh, lines to be parallel. We can force lines to be at a 90 degree angle from each other, perpendicular. 
We can force it to be horizontal, vertical. You can also force the line to become tangent with a, uh, with a circle. And you have several others. We have symmetry and we also have uh, equals to create them to be equal, force them to be equal to each other. What we are going to use now is the horizontal constraint because we want to force this into becoming a horizontal line. So we choose the horizontal constraint. You see it's blue up there to tell you that you're now going to put a horizontal constraint out. And then we see when we hover the mouse pointer over our line, we see that it turns white. And then we also see this guiding line which shows us where it's going to, going to lock it in. So we're putting this one in here. And our line became horizontal. Again, you can either use the escape button or right click and OK in order to exit the function. <coughs> now we're going to do one more thing. Okay, one, one more thing. Immediately when you're lost, it's a lot of <laughs> uh, Here is the center point of our coordinate system. So what we're going to do now, we're going to make the, the center point of this line. We're going to force it to stay directly on top of the center point here which means that we are going to use another constraint. We're going to use the coincident, which forces two points to be on top of each other. I choose it, it becomes blue. Then I hover my mouse over my line so, it, so that it turns uh, white. And then I move the mouse pointer towards the center of the line. There is the center, now it gave me a a green dot there, and if I let my uh, mouse pointer rest there, it, it's going to tell me that it's the middle point of the line. So I want to choose that one. You see it's, it stays a green dot there, because I've chosen that green dot. And now I'm also going to choose the center point here. So now I move my entire line down here, so it's going straight through the center point. So I exit the constraint function. <coughs> now, the construction line that we've created now is the same as the symmetry line that's going straight through the middle of this plate. So everything on top of the, uh, uh, everything above the symmetry line is mirrored on the bottom. So what we're going to do now, we're going to create one either the bottom half or the top half, and then we're going to mirror it. So I think I'm going to start with the bottom half, create that one first. I'll wait a bit before I continue, you can see there are... So the thought now is that we're going to start creating the outline here. But I'm going to do it in a slightly roundabout manner because I'm going to avoid Inventor doing these automatic uh, stuff that it wants to do. So I'm going to make sure that it doesn't do any of the automatic stuff and then I'm going to do everything manually as I go along just so that you get the feel of how you can fix stuff if Inventor automatically does something you don't want it to do. <coughs> so we'll start off by creating more lines but before we start doing that we have to check something because when we created this line we told it to be a construction line so now we have to see is the construction line option still marked with blue so we go over here we see the construction line and it's still marked with blue so now we have to Click it once more, 
And now it has a gray background instead of a blue one. So that's what we want. Because we want regular lines now. We don't want construction lines. The lines that we are creating now will be the actual outline of our plate. So then we need them to be continuous lines. Over to the line function again. Select it. And now I'll start off. I'll try to replicate this one like this. So I'll start off with this point, and I'll place it pretty close to the end here. I'm not going to connect it to the end because I'm going to do that manually. So I'm going to place it a bit off here. That will be my starting point. And now we see this, this first line that I'm going to create of the bottom half goes at an angle downwards, so I'm going to set this one at an angle. And I'm just placing it at random right now. I'm not giving it any dimensions or anything. I'm just placing it randomly. I just want the lines that I'm going to create now to have the general shape of the bottom half of the plates. So there I place the, place the uh, line that's going at an angle. The next line here will be, uh, it's supposed to be horizontal also, but I'm going to put it at a slight angle just so that it doesn't automatically force it to be horizontal. So if I drag it, drag it out here, it tries to do it forced horizontally right now, so I'm going to just tilt it a bit upwards. And now it's not trying to force it into anything anymore. So I'm placing it right there. And for now, we are going to disregard the fact that we have rounded edges uh, on these. Well, we're just going to make sharp angles on them. We're going to fix those edges later on. Which means that we are supposed to be going straight up right now for, for this part, straight up. But again, we're going to put it at a slight angle to avoid this automatic locking. So if you see, if I put it straight up in relation to this line, it wants to give it a 90 degree lock. So it wants to lock it at 90 degrees. I don't want that. So I'm going to move it a bit over here. But when I moved it a bit over there, now it wants to lock it vertically. I don't want that either, so I'm going to move it even further. So now I've got it in a place where it's not going to lock onto anything. So the next part will be the uh, horizontal line that's supposed to be here. Again, I don't want it to lock onto anything, so I'm going to be very careful before I place it. You can see here it wants to place it horizontally. And there it actually wants to make it parallel with this line. I don't want that either. So I'm going to move it even further up. There. And now we have the last line, which will be from the corner here and up to the half point on this edge. And we're going to put this one also at a slight angle and fairly close to fairly close to, to this edge. But you see now it, it wants to do something with this point. He's showing me this dotted line over here. So we want, we want it to be connected somehow to that point. I don't want that either. So I'm going to move it even further. And now he doesn't want to do anything specifically with it, so I'm going to place it there. Now we're done placing lines, we're going to start forcing them into the correct shapes. So either the escape button on your keyboard, or right click and OK. Just give you a chance to catch up a bit before I continue. If you're lost, say it now, please. Right. Then we'll go back to the uh, constraints up here. Because what we want to do now is that we want to connect the ends of our outline. We want to connect them to directly to the symmetry line ends. So we're going to use the same one that we use to connect the middle of the symmetry line, the coincident constraint. We mark that one so that it becomes blue. Then we go down to the first point here. We're going to connect it to the end of the symmetry line. So 
this point connected to that point. And now you see it actually moved everything here because it had to it had to make these two points come together. So then it just moved everything a bit. And now we're going to do the same over here to get these these two endpoints to connect. Choose one of them, and then the other. And now we tilted it slightly just so that it could connect them. <coughs> so again, you can use the escape button or right click and OK. And for now, we're just going to drop this, this uh, line that's supposed to be at an angle. We're not going to think about this one for now. We're going to focus on these because we want these to be at right angles to each other and they're going to be horizontal and vertical. So we'll start off with the first one and I'm going to show you a couple of different ways of doing this. So for the first one, it's supposed to be vertical here, but I'm going to tell it to be at a 90 degree angle to the symmetry line. So then we go up to the constraints part up there again and I'm going to find the perpendicular constraints. And even the symbols are a bit telling by themselves. As you can see here, you have a red line and then you have a black line that's going at a 90 degree angle for it. So we choose that one. And now it wants me to select the two lines that are going to have a 90 degree angle between them. So I'll choose this line and then I choose the symmetry line. And remember that the symmetry line, we have forced the symmetry line to be horizontal now. So the only line it could move was this one. So that's why it moved that line. We'll continue on by making this line at a 90 degree angle to this line. There we're more or less back to our original shape now. And these two lines, we're going to use the parallel option just to show that I could have just continued on telling this line to be 90 degrees to that one and this line to be 90 degrees to that one. It's not a problem. You can do that if you want to. But now I'm just going to show you the parallel constraint also. So I use the right click button and OK. And then right beside the perpendicular constraint, we have the parallel constraint. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to tell this line to become parallel with that line. So I choose them both, and then they come, become parallel. And you might have noticed that we are getting these symbols that are showing here. And they are telling us that now Inventor has forced these lines to be parallel. We'll also use the parallel on the bottom line here and make it parallel to the symmetry line. Like that. Now we have the basic shape here. We don't have any of the dimensions in yet, but we are going to start putting in the dimensions. So we'll right click and press OK. So now none of the constraints are marked with blue anymore. And then we have the general dimension constraints. What should it be parallel to? What do you want it to be parallel to? The general dimension constraint allows us to place dimensions and force lines to lines or points to be at a specific length from each other. So what we are going to do now is, first off, I'm going to tell it to be how, how uh, uh, deep it's going to be here, basically. So the length from the symmetry line to the bottom line is what I'm going to tell it. And if we look at the first page of the practice task in the compendium, it says that uh, above here, from this point and up to the top, it's going to be 90 millimeters. But if it's going to be 90 millimeters up there and it's symmetrical below, then it has to be 90 millimeters there also. So it doesn't really matter where, where the dimension is placed on the drawing. So now we can press the mouse button again. We can now edit the dimension. So we can write in 
90. And then you can either press the enter button on your keyboard or click the green check mark. We'll do the same from the symmetry line and down to this part. The difference now is that on our drawing, it says that the entire part here is supposed to be 60 millimeters. But the part that we have drawn in here is just half of it. So we need 30 millimeters instead. When you do this, you need to double click. When it's blue, if it's like this. So I place this dimension here. And I can either put in 30, or you can also put in actually a uh, mathematical uh, equation there. So what I can do is write in the 60, which is the total length. And then I can do a divisor line. And I divide it by 2. And then it's going to automatically put in 30. I'll do a... We'll do a 15 minute break. It's the dimensions from the symmetry line going across there and the heights. And now we need to set the dimensions for the lengths of this plate. So we're going to, to start off with this, the, uh, the angled uh, edge, which is, which is supposed to be from, from the tip. And to this point, it says 70 millimeters on the drawing. So we're going to choose choose the point over here. I didn't hit it. There, at that point. And then we're going to choose the point down here. And then now you'll notice that if I if I move my mouse pointer below these two points, then I get a horizontal dimension. But if I move it to the side of the two points, I get the vertical dimension instead. But we wanted the horizontal one, so I'm going to move the mouse pointer below here. Set it up, and it was supposed to be 70. I put it in for 70 there. And now, we want to do the next length, which is from this point on the drawing and all the way to this edge here. So we need 130 for that one. So we're going to choose, choose the same point here. And then I'm actually going to choose this entire line here. And then I pull it down here, and you can see it's it's uh, actually a lot, a lot too big right now. It's 230 almost, and we're only supposed to have 130. So, 130. Now this one is far too big, so now we have to fix this one. And one way of setting the last length, which is the tip here is just choosing the length of this uh, this edge, the line there. So we can, if we click directly in the middle of the line here, we're setting the length of that entire line, so it chooses automatically the end points of the line there. And according to the drawing, it's supposed to be 60, not 130. So I put in 60 there. Like that. So now we have the correct dimensions on this one. And maybe some of you also notice now that none of the lines are green anymore. That is because if you look down in this corner, it says fully constrained. So all the way down here, it says fully constrained. If I now just to show you, remove one of these uh, dimensions. You see, these, these 
three lines now became, became green again. And now it says that I need one dimension, one dimension needed. Because now if I, if I, grab, if I grab the point over here, grab it with my mouse pointer and then I try to, try to move it, you can see I can actually drag the entire thing here. It's not locked to the uh, dimensions. But as soon as I put, put the dimension back here, the 60, then everything is locked. And if I try to drag it up here anymore, I can't move it anywhere. So now it's, everything is locked into place. And that's, that's a good thing to do every, every time before you finish off a sketch. Just make sure that everything is dark blue and that it says fully constrained down in the corner. That's a smart thing to do because then you know that if you at a later point in your career come back to do a revision on this item, so you have to do, you have to change a dimension or something, then you know that if you change this one dimension, then the other dimension will stay as they are supposed to stay. They won't start moving around. <coughs> So just give people a chance to catch up before uh, before we do the mirroring. Try and look at your measurements and see and think why it's perfect now, even though you haven't set measurements or everything. Right. The next step will be to mirror all of these lines over to the other side, to the top. And the mirror function is up on the pattern part, so up, up here is the pattern part. And the nice thing about using the pattern, different types of patterns that you can use is that you don't have to do all of this dimensioning and doing, drawing all of these lines again. So you actually, you save almost half of your work by using these kinds of uh, tools. So we choose mirror up top there. And now it says the first one is select, so that one is marked blue. And you can see the mouse pointer inside the button is red. So that means that I haven't selected anything yet. So Inventor has no idea what I'm going to mirror right now. The thing is, as soon as I choose one thing, it's going to turn into a white mouse pointer, just telling me that you have selected something. But Inventor doesn't know if I've selected everything I'm supposed to select. That's our job to check. So now I'm going to choose this point. Oh, wait a minute, we have, uh, we have forgotten something. We can't do the mirror yet. We haven't rounded the edges. So we want to round the edges before we, before we do the mirror part. So in order to round the edges, we go over to the create part here, where you have the fillet function. And in the drop down there, you have both fillet and you have chamfer. So either a rounded edge or a beveled edge. But we want the rounded edge, so we want the one that's called fillet. So we choose that one. 
And the default one is always two millimeters. So if you haven't used that function earlier this day, then it's going to say two millimeters no matter what. We want it to be 20 millimeters on these two and 10 millimeters on this one. So first we'll do the 20 millimeter. So I set it to 20 up there. And now I have to start choosing my lines. So I'm going to choose the bottom line here and then this line. So the bottom one, and then I just put my mouse pointer over this, and it shows me where it's going to create the curve. As soon as I click, it's in place. And since the next one up top, the one above here, is also supposed to be 20, I don't need to do anything else now. I can just click those lines. So I want this line, and I want this line. Then it created the curve. But for the last one, we're not going to have 20 millimeters, we're going to have 10 millimeters in radius. So which means that we have to go back up to this window and we have to change the radius. So we change it to 10. And then we can select these two lines. And as you can see, the curve that it's uh, showing me here is less than these two curves. And that's correct. A 10 millimeter radius is less than a 20 millimeter, so that seems to be the correct one. Then we put it into place. And then you can either press the escape button or the cross up there or right click and OK. It's uh, almost 100 ways of doing most things in uh, the software. And now we have finally gotten to the point where we can do the mirror. So back up to pattern and mirror up there. First we have to select the lines that we wanted to draw, which means that we're going to select the lines along here. So all of them have now become bright blue which tells us that we have selected all of them. So if I hadn't selected one of these, it would still be dark blue. But I still have a red mouse pointer on the mirror line button up there. So I need to select the mirror line there, mirror line. And now I have to choose the symmetry line for it. Now that one also turned into a white mouse pointer because now it knows what line is going to, to mirror this across. Then, for some reason, in this exact function, you have to press apply first before you can press done. In other functions, you can uh, often just press done. <laughs> but for some reason, for in this one, you have to press apply first. So when you press apply, it creates a mirror image. So then we've created the entire plate, the outline of the entire plate. Now we need to give it some substance. We need to uh, take this from being a drawing and into being a three-dimensional model. So what we do is that we go to the finished sketch up there. And then I'll just use this function here, which says zoom all. Because then it just zooms out enough to, to show me everything uh, that I've drawn. One thing that can be quite good to do right now is to actually save before we continue on. Because if something happens, you can save while you're in a sketch. But if something happens to Inventor and it crashes, then you have lost everything from your last save. So that is very uh, good to do saves every now and then. <laughs> So we'll do our first save, and so long as you're in your correct project, it's going to choose that folder for, for the project. And I would advise you to try to try to give it some uh, some different name than part one or part two, as Inventor usually calls them. In this case, we are creating a plate, so 
it might be wise to call it plate because that's descriptive of the file. So I'm going to call it plate. Now I've saved it. One way that you can check that you have actually saved it is if you do give it an individual name. You will see all the way at the top there, all the way up here. Now it says plate.ipt instead of part1.ipt. So now it actually knows that it's working from my saved file. <coughs> now we need to take this sketch and create a three-dimensional part from it. And we're going to use the extrude function up there, which basically means that you take an outline and you sort of pull material out of it. And since we only had one continuous outline inside our sketch, it meant to automatically select it. If we had had uh, several outlines in here, if we had uh, the three different plates inside our one sketch, then we would have had to have chosen which one to extrude. One or two or three. Uh, we could have chosen all three if we wanted that also. And the default is 10 millimeters, and we were supposed to create a 10 millimeter plate right now. So actually all we need to do for this one is just press the check mark or the enter button on your keyboard. Well, now we have created the plate, but it also says in our practice task that it's supposed to be an aluminum plate with an alloy 6061. And if we look all the way at the top here, all the way up there, that's the material bar, which tells us which material we are creating. And right now it just says generic, which is the default. And we don't want the generic material. That's not something that actually exists. So we open that drop-down menu, and it is alphabetical. And we are going to have aluminum, so we need to go to more or less to the top. And there we can see aluminum 6061. So we choose that one. And you see, up here it turned pretty, uh, pretty much brighter than what it. It was when I changed it. That's mostly the projector. It won't be that, that, uh, that much brighter on your screen. It will change a little bit in color, but it won't be quite as bright as it is up here. So now we've extruded it and we've set the material that we're supposed to use. So we are done with this part. So once again, we'll press the save button just to save what we just did. Like that. And since we have technical difficulties with the wrong inventor uh, edition on my computer, we'll just continue on and create the project for part two. And then we'll do the 3D model for part two also. So then you can either press the, the large inventor icon up, up in the corner there and open this, this new uh, part, or you can just press the sheet beside there, which also says new. So if we just press the sheet there, we're going to open up this, this window again. But we can't do that, can we? Because we were supposed to create a project for our practice test too. If we, uh, if we want, if we want our uh, part in practice task two parts to be inside the project of practice task one, then we can do this. But we don't want that. We want to create a different project, and that is mostly just to give you some training in creating projects and managing different projects. So we do cancel there. We open the inventor icon up there, and we go down to the manage option. And there you see at the top we have projects, where it says create or edit projects.
So then we get this window up again. We press new, new single user project. And I'll name it practice task 2B. And I have to choose my computer and my H drive. I'll go to my lecture folder and I'll create a new folder there. I'll call it practice task 2B. And again, I have a problem with it's not actually the new folder that's being chosen here. So I have to click a different one and then back to to practice task two, because now it says practice task two there. Then I press OK to choose this folder. And I'll just check over seeing it's, it's on the H drive, so that's where I want it to be. So I push finish. And then I get a problem. The active project cannot be changed while inventor files are open, it says. And that's just because we have, or at least I have, I'm not sure if you uh, still have, but I have this part open in the background and it belongs to practice task one project. So it has created practice task 2B, but it's not to put the check mark beside it because it's still inside practice task one. So what I have to do is just push okay, click done, and I have to close, close my part file. So when I close it, now it's closed down, then I can change my project. So I open the projects again. Open it. There. You and now I'm going to make sure that I have the check mark beside practice task two there. So I go to practice task two. And I double click it. And now I move the check mark to practice task two. So for practice task two, we're going to create this plate. So we have some holes in it and everything. So we'll go to the new option again. And now we're in the new project, so now it's sent back to the templates folder. We have to choose the metric one. And we want the standard part in millimeters. And we press create. And in order to start off, we'll start with a new two-dimensional sketch. Again, just because I prefer it, I'll use the horizontal plane. You can choose whatever plane you want to. And I'll twist the view cube so that my top is in the uh, correct orientation. So, 
for this one, for practice task two, we actually have a symmetry line going through the middle, a vertical one. So we'll do the same as we did for, for the first practice task. We'll create a symmetry line, only this time we'll create it vertically instead of horizontally. So I choose the construction line option up there. Choose a new line up here. And now I'm going to let Inventor start automatically uh, doing things for me. So as I hold it right below my center here, you can, I'm not sure how well you can see it, but there are dots going all the way up to the center from my mouse pointer, which means that it's trying to, to connect it to the center there. So I'm going to place my starting point down here. I'm going to pull it across the center. And I'm going to allow Inventor to lock it into a vertical position. And I just want to make that one, so I'm exiting the function. And just to make sure I won't make any more construction lines, I'm going to remove the blue mark on the construction line. So now the only thing I need to do now, if I want this one to be centered, is that I need to make the center point of the line connected to the, the uh, center point of the, the axis system. So I use the coincident constraint up here, make it blue, place my mouse pointer onto the line, I move it downwards until I get a green dot. There's the green dot, it was almost at the center. I select the green dot, and then I select the center. So now it turned dark blue because now I've locked it into place in the center. The only thing that isn't locked on this one now is the length of it. That's going to be, be uh, locked into place as we go along. As you can see down in the corner, it says one dimension needed. So that's the length of the line that's missing. So I think I'm going to create this side of the plate, and then we're going to do mirror on this one also. So I'll use the line function up there. But now I'm going to let Inventor connect it to the endpoint of my, of my uh, symmetry line. So instead of placing it on the side and then connecting it, I'm just going to let it automatically do it. It's got an automatic connection there. And the bottom of the plate is supposed to be horizontal. So now I can let Inventor automatically do it. And it's either going to do it in a 90 degree angle to the symmetry line, or it's going to do it as a horizontal line. It doesn't really matter which one it chooses. So in this case, it wants to do it as a horizontal constraint. It's not a problem for us. So we're going to place this one. I'm going to give myself some room here, so I'm going to place it over there. And I'm going to continue on with this side. And I want it to go straight up. And now Inventor wants to put it at a 90 degree angle to the previous line, which is fine by me. So I put this one up here. And now we need a slightly angled one. So this one, I won't allow Inventor to, to uh, do anything with this one. So I'm just going to put it at an angle. Then we need a horizontal line again. So I'm going to let Inventor make it. In this case, it wants to make it parallel to this one, which is OK. So I'm putting it down there. And now we need to go down into this notch. See, there. Again, it wants to do it 90 degrees to this one, which is OK. And then we need to continue on into the center of the plate. So my notch is uh, far too big here right now, but that's not a problem. 
So I can exit the, the function right now. <clears throat> there is one thing now that I want to do before I start putting the dimensions in. And it's the fact that I've connected uh, to the symmetry line down here, but I have no connection to the endpoint up here. And I would like this endpoint to stop when it reaches the same height as this line. So I'm going to use the coincident constraint. Then I choose the endpoint of the symmetry line. Doesn't matter, you can change the... And then I choose the line itself over here, which means that the endpoint will stay on the same line. And I would actually lift the line so that it would stay with the with the endpoint. Now we can start doing uh, dimensions on this one. Just draw this contour. And on the drawing it says that the entire bottom is supposed to be 210. So what we'll do is we'll choose the line, the bottom line that we have made, which is supposed to be half. Put that one in. And then we write 210. We divide by 2 to get half of it. And then we press enter or the check mark. Then it makes it automatically, automatically to 105. Just a little break so that people catch up. It's not going to be too tough. It's Uh, 
The drawing also says that this, this edge is going to be 110 millimeters. So I'm going to do the same for this one. I'm going to choose the line itself. And then I set it to 110. Press the enter button. And now I need to, I need, now I need to drag and drop a bit to get things in the correct position. Or I can set the distance from the bottom and to the top. And that is going to fix everything for me. So the distance from the bottom here and to the top, it's going to be the same as this line, 110, plus the last 20 that go up top there. So 110 plus 20. I push my enter button. And now it's fixed the angled line for me. <coughs> the depth of the notch in the middle there is supposed to be 30. So I'm going to set this one to 30 millimeters and the width of the notch is also supposed to be so the width across here is supposed to be 30 millimeters also but we are only drawing half of it since we have a symmetry line in the middle so like we did on the bottom line I'm going to do the full length and divide by 2 so 30 divide by 2 The main reason that I'm doing these calculations while I'm putting the dimensions in is because I've actually been on the receiving end of doing these calculations in my head, putting in the dimension, and then later on realizing that, whoops, I did the calculation wrong in my head. So it's actually a bit safer just to make inventor do the calculation for you. From the outside edge, and over to, to where the angle line stops, it's supposed to be 50 millimeters. So that's the next dimension we're going to set. Because as we can see, this is the only one that's green still. So I choose the outside line. First the outside line and then the end point there. And I set the dimension to 50 millimeters. Now everything is dark blue, and it says fully constrained down here. And then we can mirror it. <coughs> so again, up to the patterns, and use the mirror function. And at first it wants us to select all of the lines that we need to mirror, and then we ought to select the mirror line itself. And one way of doing this a bit quicker is to use the drag and drop, creating a box, a selection box. I'm going to do that now. I'm going to drag and drop over here. So I get this red selection box. And it is important that you don't, you don't do everything. So don't mark the symmetry line as well. Stop before you get to the symmetry line and let go. Then we can see this one is bright blue all the way over here, but this one is dark blue and that one is dark blue. So I have to select those also. 
because it didn't manage to do those in the box. Then I select the mirror line, and that's the symmetry line again that we're going to use. Now I've got a white mouse pointer on both, both of the uh, things I'm going to select. Mm -hmm. And I press the apply button. And everything has been mirrored. Okay, so the last thing we're going to do in this lecture is to finish our sketch. And then again, I would advise that we save it, just to be on the safe side. This one I'm going to call plate with holes. I'm going to log it the whole time. So there you go, Perfect. And then we're going to extrude it. But this time we're supposed to have a 5 millimeter plate and not a 10 millimeter, so we have to change the dimension. So 5 millimeters, and there we have it. So next week we're going to place the holes in the plates and then we are going to create the drawings for both of these plates before we continue on.